Finally, back in my natural habitat. Now these city kids could see what I'm capable of. Behold, my big, beautiful flame. They were in awe of my skill. When suddenly, the fun was put to an end by some overreacting teachers. They started yelling at me, saying there's a rule against fire. Ugh, how could you call this a campsite if campfire is not even allowed? Fire making is an essential survival skill, y'all. These boring city people don't know a thing. Who needs all their rules anyway? I know I don't. Hi, I'm Nova, the fire hazard. And I didn't always live in the city. I spent the first 14 years of my life on the road. Our family used to travel the country in our RV. We never stayed any place more than a couple of months. We foraged for food and slept under the stars. But my world was flipped upside down when my parents decided to divorce. My mom wanted to settle down and my dad would continue life on the road. I begged to go with dad, but mom had custody of me. I'd love to stay with you, my little birdie, but I have to go. No cage can hold me for too long. At that moment, I promised myself I would break free and spread my wings too. My mom and I then settled into a small two-bedroom apartment in Savannah, Georgia, where we were greeted by our neighbors, Brenda Foster, a middle school teacher, and her son, Scott, who I'd soon be attending school with. Mrs. Foster was really friendly, but from the moment I met Scott, I knew we wouldn't get along. City people were always grumpy and glued to their cell phones. Mom had to work two jobs just to make ends meet. Accountant by day, Burger King employee by night. Her colorful wardrobe was replaced with dull uniforms, and all we ate now was fast food. I still kept a sheer hope that one day, when Mom makes enough money, we will hit the road again soon, but... No, this is going to be our forever home. Things might be hard for you at first, but trust me, it'll be good for you in the long run. That sounds like she wants my life to be this boring and stuffy for all eternity. Then came school. There were tons of rules, and every moment of our day was scheduled. In just one morning, I got in trouble for going to the bathroom and for eating my lunch. And on top of that, every teacher complained about my penmanship and spelling. But things were worse when I was among other kids. I could hear their whispers everywhere I went. One girl even came up to me and asked why I wore weird hippie clothes. My clothes aren't weird, you are! Even when some of them invited me to sit with them at lunch, I felt like an outsider. Anyone down for some pink drinks after school? Not me, I'm saving up for the era's tour. Count me in! I'm entering my pink girl era! None of these words they say makes any sense to me. Finally, they asked about my old life. Well, we didn't have to eat this junk. We can get fresh vegetables by the road. And I know how to skin roadkills. And every day we tried many different fruits and fungi. But be careful, a simple mushroom could kill you. But by that point, I noticed they were either speechless or as pale as a ghost. Did I say something wrong? Every school day was a blur of confusing subjects. But today was my first music lesson, and I was so excited to finally do something I was good at. When the music teacher, Mr. Shapiro, asked if anyone wanted to perform for the class, I sprung up from my seat, ready to go. I confidently sang my favorite song, but halfway through, Mr. Shapiro interrupted me. We're learning classical music. That style is called reggae, which we don't teach here. <laughs> Nova's a hippy-dippy weirdo. The whole class erupted into laughter. What did I do? Ugh! Scott! I was so gonna give him a taste of my rosewood guitar, but everyone held me back. In the end, Mr. Shapiro said he'd be talking with our moms after school. Scott and his mom had already left before my mom came. Mr. Shapiro told her that I was a violent hothead who always dressed inappropriately. I waited for my mom to defend me, but she simply apologized. I'll talk to her about this later. Please excuse her behavior. She has never been to school before. Who was this woman and what had she done to my mother? Later, I told my mom how terrible school was, the constant staring and teasing, the way that everyone seemed to be a little afraid of me. Contrary to my expectations, she told me I should try harder to blend in, and she even had bought me normal clothes for school. Mom, clothes are my self-expression. I'm not changing just to fit in. What happened to you? Didn't you teach me to be myself? I did, but now I need you to blend in so you can make friends. I... I had to leave before bursting into tears. I couldn't stay in the stuffy apartment any longer. So I went out the window, climbed down the fire escape, and just ran away. But at one point, I realized I didn't know where to go. So I wandered around until I bumped into the Fosters, who insisted on walking me back home. Strangely, Scott seemed less annoying now, and kept looking awkwardly at me the whole way home. My mom was clearly surprised to see me when she opened the door. I felt like a joke, because she hasn't even noticed my rebellious great escape.
I couldn't sleep that night. After thinking it over, I came to the conclusion that I could get my old life back if I found my dad. If only I knew how. The next morning at school, I went looking for the tools I needed to find my dad. Compass, flashlight, map. Scott? What are you up to in there? You first. I wanted to apologize for what happened in music class yesterday. Your turn. I'm gathering what I need to go find my dad, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Stop you? It looks like you need help. Those things may have helped you hundreds of years ago, but these days we just use the internet. I didn't want Scott's help, but maybe he was right. I had no clue where to start, and I could hardly even figure out how to use my cell phone. <sighs> maybe I need a little help to learn about the internet. Follow me. Scott spent that afternoon teaching me the basics of the internet. He also asked about my old life, and I found myself telling him everything. All the things I missed and hated about this new life. To my surprise, he was understanding. His mother was a single mom too, and it had been years since he heard from his father. After that day, I thought I hated him a bit less. About a week later, I felt like I was ready to start my search. Little did I know, googling my dad's name would give me literally millions of results. I was about to give up when I saw some people looking for their dogs. Hmm, that just gave me an idea. I printed as many flyers as the library would allow and spent the next day putting them up around the neighborhood. I was surprised by a strange phone number. Hello? Yeah, hi. I just saw a clueless hippie wandering around and I think they matched the description you provided. I was over the moon by how quick I got a response. But then I saw Scott, half a block away, grinning at me with a cell phone in his hand. That internet thing you taught me is useless. Finding people is not that fast, even with the internet. Your best bet would be the database at the police station. Are you sure you... I didn't need to hear any more words and immediately flagged down a police car passing by. Over here, officer! The officer pulled over and rolled down his window. Morning, sir. Please take us to the station. What are you kids doing? Where are your parents? Well, I'm looking for my dad. I heard the officer speak into his intercom, saying he was bringing a lost child back to the station. Well, that's not what I meant, but whatever does the job, I guess. As he led me into the back of the car, I remembered. Sir, he's with me. Should we bring him too? Correction, two lost kids. Scott was obviously stunned as the police officer escorted us into his car. It's hilarious. <laughs> of course, I need my sidekick with me to help me find that database thingy. Shortly after arriving at the station, the officer left the room to get us some water. As soon as the door closed behind him, I sprung into action. I had to look in every corner, but Scott wasn't helping. Come help me. Where could that database thingy be in this room? What? No, dummy. It's in here. Then he jumped to the computer and did some clicking. Type your dad's name here. Keep an eye out. In an instant, a file with my dad's info came up. I printed it out and sprinted home before the ink could dry. My heart was pounding as I dialed my dad's number. Hey, yo. Dad, it's so good to hear your voice. Uh, who is this? It's me, Dad! Complete silence on the other end. Did I call the wrong number? It's me? Nova? Nova! Glad to hear from you. Guess what, kid? I've been up to all kinds of adventures. Then he talked to me about his amazing trips that I would have loved to be on. Then I asked where he was so I could go find him. I live in the moment, my little birdie. I go where the road takes me. Please, Dad, let me tag along. Okay, meet me at the exit of the interstate at 10 p.m. tomorrow. He ended the call before I could say anything else. I felt the sudden urge to cry for some reason. They must be happy tears. I was finally seeing my dad again. But how could I get there? Maybe my sidekick Scott could help me. If he had made it back from the police station. Oopsies! I ran to Scott's apartment and to my surprise he answered the door. Hey, how did you get home? Once I explained to the officer that you were just a little eccentric, he let me go. I'm sorry I left you there. I wasn't really thinking. Oh, I spoke to my dad, and he's picking me up tomorrow night. So, I need your help to get to the highway. The highway? What kind of parent asks his 14-year-old to meet him at the highway at night? Did he even ask you how you were doing? Or your mom? He clearly doesn't care at all. Wait, yeah, he really didn't ask. But dad probably was just busy. We can talk all about it tomorrow when we meet anyway. How dare Scott think ill of him? What do you know about my dad? He's a free spirit, and I should be traveling with him. Life's all about being spontaneous. My mom doesn't even understand it anymore, so I don't expect you to. But if you don't want to help me, fine. I'll figure it out myself. Then I stormed off. The night after, I was struggling with Google Maps. My phone was suddenly snatched out of my hand. I'll take you there. You might get lost if you go alone. I was still a little upset about yesterday, but that was nice of him. Plus, Scott was right. I would get lost on my own. We arrived early and waited. 
The hours dragged by, so I called Dad several times, but no answer. When I saw it was past 11 p.m., my call finally came through. Oh, man. You were there now? Our bus passed Savannah a while ago. <laughs> we're having a grand party. You should see. Oh, well, maybe we'll cross paths again soon. Bye, little birdie. He hung up right away. I noticed Scott watched me for a reaction, but I couldn't hold it in and burst into tears. Scott got us on the bus to go home. I was sobbing the entire way and couldn't talk through all the tears. Eventually, Scott spoke up. When my parents divorced, I spent a lot of time being mad at my mom, too. I couldn't understand why she didn't make my dad stay. But she did try to, right? Nope. She just accepted it. And I eventually realized that she wasn't weak like I had thought. She chose to stay to make sure my life was normal. Leaving would have been easy. And what she did, keeping the lights on, actually took a lot more strength. What Scott said sounded surprisingly mature. After that, we sat in silence for a while. I understood what Scott was saying, but I didn't think it applied to my case. My mom was just not the person she used to be. We arrived home very late. Before we parted, Scott said, Why don't you ask your mom why she decided to settle down here? Kids don't always understand why parents do certain things. Maybe you should hear her out. I nodded and took a deep breath before opening the door. My mom was on the phone with the cops, and as soon as she saw me, she ran to give me the biggest hug I had gotten in a long time. She asked me where I'd been, and I told her everything. How I tried to find Dad, how he stood me up, and things Scott said earlier. She listened to me attentively, then said what Dad did was terrible, but not exactly out of character. You know how we stopped by a town from time to time? Working temporary jobs like waiting tables and washing cars, right? What you didn't know is that your father always messed up and got fired a few days after he started, so he decided that he'd look after you while I worked. I didn't realize how hard Mom had always been working while me and Dad were just carelessly having fun. Then I asked why she chose that life in the first place. When I met him, I was working a 9-to-5 job that I hated. While your dad was all about, the world is a book, traveling makes you a storyteller. Of course, that sounded fascinating. So I quit my job and set myself free on the RV we bought. But why did you decide to settle down after all these years? After having you, I realized our wandering life wasn't a good environment for a kid. I was worried you'd have a hard time once you got older. Especially because your dad wasn't being helpful and was only being a bad example for you. Besides, homeschooling is difficult. We aren't teachers. You deserve to grow up in a stable home, have friends your age, and create deep connections with them. I got you two, and... and people we met from all over the country. But not enough, honey. I thought I should give you a normal life while you're still young. You'll be better prepared to make your own decisions later as an adult. It was unfair to you. Because you didn't choose that life. We did. The resentment I had towards my mom melted away. In its place was a profound gratitude for all that she sacrificed. I wasn't good with words, so I told her that the best way I could. Do you miss our old life? Well, yes. But for now, you're my number one priority. After the hurt's gone, it was time to heal. I tried to focus on my lessons and learn the rules. My mom even helped me pick out clothes that were more appropriate for school, but still felt like me. I tried my best to enjoy the same movies as other kids and learned to play their favorite songs on my guitar. Soon enough, they became my new friends. I continued to grow even closer to Scott, my friend and partner in crime, from the start. Still, my mom and I agreed that we shouldn't totally abandon our love for travel, and she promised that we would plan a few big road trips every year, starting this summer. I can hardly wait for our trip to Niagara Falls with Mrs. Foster and Scott. Blue sky, white clouds, golden sand. Such a perfect day for sunbathing on this luxury Hawaiian beach, while being served by Kirby, my arch enemy. That brat used to tease me all the time about my old clothes and messy hair. Little did she know, I was secretly a millionaire. Earth to chlorine. Castle building all day won't fill your stomach. Finish your shift and go home. Well, Mary, who doesn't want to get rich? Sadly, some of us can only dream about it. If you want to be Cinderella, then go find yourself a prince. Just not Danny. He's just as poor as us. Do not underestimate my Danny. My precious heart fell for him for a reason. It's just that he doesn't seem to realize that we're destined for each other yet. But Mary was right. My dinner won't cook itself. Let's see what we can afford for tonight. My dad left us when I was four. And since then, mom worked her socks off to provide for us. So it was down to me to also work to save up for my law school dream. All of a sudden, groceries started raining down on me. Bottles tumbled off the shelves and broke into pieces right by my feet. Ah, is it an earthquake? 
I stooped down and prayed until it stopped. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but geez, it sure left a freaking mess. Warren, the store owner, looked distraught. This place was all he had, so I helped him clean up and place anything undamaged back on the shelves. Before you leave, please take this as a token of my gratitude. I hope it brings you luck. A lottery ticket? I don't know how this game works. I'll show you. It's simple. Each ticket has a unique set of numbers. Just check the results on TV tonight and see if they match. Let me see. Your numbers are 15, 26, 14, 48, 07, 23. Hey, those are the lucky numbers that have been on my mind all day. I want that ticket. Kirby, stop poking your nose in my business, will you? Sorry, miss. That's the last ticket today, and I already gave it to Clarine. Then I'll buy it. Here's your two bucks. Give it to me. You wish. I didn't really care about this ticket, but there's no way I was going to let her get what she wanted. And surely, she wouldn't leave me alone. How about ten bucks? That's a fortune to the likes of you. No thanks. I'd rather win millions instead and make you my maid. Look, you'll never get anything from me, be it this ticket or Danny. Just give up. Fine! Let me skip this stupid ticket, but Danny, never! Why are we always bickering, you ask? Well, we're both competing for the heart of Danny. Tennis extraordinaire and brooding Adonis. Actually, I thought I had more advantage as he worked part-time at the same restaurant. But nope, Danny was such a cold fish. I tried again and again, but every single time, he just gave me a soulless thank you and that's it. If only I could build him his own tennis courts, perhaps he'd change his attitude. But that's impossible for a poor girl like me, unless I somehow hit the jackpot. The lucky numbers today are 48, 07, 15. Should I add winning the lottery to my daydream list? <laughs> 26, 14. Is it just me or do those numbers sound familiar? No way, it can't be. And the mega ball is... 23! Now if your ticket has all six numbers, you win over 20 million dollars! Play on! Me! I think I just become a millionaire! God had answered my prayers. What? Kirby's here too? The ticket must have hit it for real. I rush there to rummage through the trash. And, ah, here it is! It's mine! As if. Let's go ask Warren who this ticket belongs to then. Brilliant. And then give him a third of the prize? Do you really expect him not to ask for a share? Right. Okay, let it go and I'll give you a 30% share. Great ratio, but 30% is a perfect fit for you. I'll take 70%. And Danny. Oh, that's how you want to play. Fine then. How about whoever wins Danny's heart gets 70%? Deal. So we agreed to hide the lottery ticket in a trunk with two locks. Each of us kept one key to it. Then we buried it in a bush at school. Looks like the secret race between us starts now. Kirby wasted no time and brought Danny the showiest lunches ever. But he kept up his cold exterior and barely acknowledged her. Seems like I need a more delicate approach. So I told Mary to arrange a team building game among the restaurant staff, in which we all had to answer the same questions to understand one another better. Oh look! He liked watching Star Trek, listening to Sam Smith, and reading Harry Potter like me. Oh, Danny boy, I told you we were destined to be a pair. Next question. What is the key to maintaining a long-term relationship? There's our very first answer. Feelings? Come on, Danny, be realistic. What uses do feelings have if you can even afford to go on a date? Poor people can also be happy in love, but I don't think pragmatic people like you can. No, no, he misunderstood what I meant. After that, he ignored me completely. Worse still, Kooky Kirby never left him alone. She even brought the whole cheerleading team to do this ridiculous routine while he was playing. Who cheers on a tennis court? She was going big, so I needed to step up my game. It's time to bust out my college savings. I spent the whole day at the mall buying him gifts and giving myself a makeover. This is the first time in my life I've spent my hard-earned money without considering the price. It feels so good, but at the same time, kind of bad. But I could make it up with the lottery money once I got Danny's heart. Look, I saw this watch and I immediately thought of you. I even met a professional tennis player at the mall. Can you believe it? And they told me this racket is the best. What do you think? You're crazy. This costs thousands. Why are you doing this? Um, that's not the reaction I was expecting, but I like you, Danny. 
I've not been brave enough to tell you this because I had nothing. But soon, my life would change and I can give you everything. I don't need those things. You're so wasteful and superficial. You really think money can buy anything, including feelings? Why was he so mad at me? I thought he must have noticed that I'd worked really hard for all this and even made myself look prettier for him. Okay, he might not like my gifts, but is it so bad that I want to be a little generous to myself now that I have some money? Things got even worse when later I arrived at work to see Kirby booking out the entire restaurant to let her, Danny, take a rest and enjoy dinner with her. Fine, you win, Kirby. I give up. <sighs> nothing, basically nothing went the way I wanted. My luck, my money, my man. Now I'm fine with just the 30% God gave me. I'm done chasing anyone. Only my stray friends understand me. Muffin, Brownie, Oreo. Wait, where's Cupcake? Looking for him? Let him go. This wasteful, superficial girl needs to make sure he's not starving. So you're the one who feeds them every day? Why do you care? Go back to your date with Kirby. I'm just a materialist who thinks money solves everything. I'm sorry for how I acted earlier. It's just that, at home, I'm surrounded by people who are all about money. So I hate that way of life. Why aren't you talking like you come from money or something? Yeah, kinda. My parents are the presidents of Sunland Corp. What? The biggest furniture corporation in the city? Unbelievable! So why are you working part-time at a restaurant? I want to earn my own money. An independent life suits me much better. You're so silly. Why struggle if you don't have to? If I were you, my life would be so different. I'd make sure that my mom didn't need to work all the time to make ends meet. I could even go to any expensive law school I want and care for all the stray cats and dogs I find. Surprisingly, this time, Danny didn't look at me with jaded eyes like before. Instead, he just listened patiently and gave me the sweetest smile ever. But not love. That's one thing money can't buy. H how about Kirby? Did any of her grand gestures impress you? <laughs> I prefer the cats. Our talk has confirmed that there's still a chance for me. Kirby's only advantage over me is money. But Danny doesn't care about that anyway. Is that the new student? Seems like Danny just found a worthy opponent. He's Finn. Look how he smiles whenever his opponent catches up a point. Wait, did you just call Danny someone's opponent? Someone has a new crush. Who? who? Don't talk nonsense. Right then, a ball zoomed toward us. And holy moly, Finn caught it just mere inches from Kirby's face. Are you okay? She's fine. Her face always turns red. Nothing to do with a ball. Kirby was so embarrassed that she ran off. <laughs> it seems our race took a turn. But then, shockingly, Finn turned to me and asked for my number? Huh? Does my charm glow this much? Everyone knew I liked Danny, but he's such a riddle. Hmm, maybe I could use Finn as my last card to make Danny jealous and bait Kirby to give up on our deal. What a genius I am! Then, for the next few days, whenever Danny was around, I flirted with Finn and made sure Kirby saw us. One day, I made an excuse to borrow Finn's phone. Then I secretly used it to send Danny a message to stir up his jealousy. If you don't like Clarine, then let me play with this innocent girl for a bit. And Kirby also needs a kick to admit her feelings as well, right? Actually, I like you. Looking into your eyes, I know you also have feelings for me. So... And finally, I set a date for them at the tennis court tonight at 8. If Danny doesn't want me to get hurt and Kirby doesn't want to miss her true love, they'll show up. Then I covered up my tracks, blocked both our numbers, and returned his phone. Thank you so much. Are you free tonight? Come to the tennis court. I have something important to tell you. Oh god, Finn looks like he just won the Wimbledon. That night, Finn got there early and was really excited. Let's see who'll raise the curtain. Ah, it's Kirby. Oh Finn, you had me at hello. But admitting my feelings means I lose the deal with Clarine, so... What do you mean? What deal? No, no, don't get me wrong. Actually, we won the lottery and made a deal to share it. Anyways, silly me. Money can compare to you. Lottery? You two share it? Why did she even mention the money? Right when it's getting messy, Danny turned up. Bastard, now you're two-timing? Danny, why are you here? He's just playing with you. This jerk is seeing both you and Kirby. Don't let him fool you. I think Finn is a nice guy. Plus, I've told you how I felt, but you've never seemed to like me back. So Finn, we... Finn told me he liked me. Clarine, I like you. More than you know. Can't you see? I've given a lot of... Hints. I always make excuses to go home with you. I told you that feelings are the most important thing to me. As in my feelings for you. Really? 
Idiot, how am I supposed to pick up those hints? So this daydreamer wasn't just imagining things? Turns out my plan actually did succeed. Kirby, it's true, I do like you. But I thought you were out of my league, so I just wanted to ask Clarine for help. Oh, how nice. Kirby, with a huge grin, then admitted I won. Then she dragged Finn away. Hmm, I guess my biggest win is successfully pairing up two couples. The next morning, Kirby and I opened the trunk to get the ticket. When to our utter shock, Finn swooped in and snatched it away. While we were still processing what was going on, he ran off with our millions. But then, a shadow sent him tumbling to the ground. Danny? I saw him following you two and knew he was up to something shady. Then, Finn confessed that he transferred schools and approached me for the lottery ticket following his dad's order, who's none other than... Warren! He knew it was a jackpot winning ticket, so he set up a plan to steal it from me. I'm so sorry. My dad's a gambling addict, which left him heavily in debt, and only this ticket could save him. Oh, Finn. I believe he's not a bad person. This ticket was originally from Warren anyway, so we both agreed to give him a share to pay off his debt. Finn was moved and handed the ticket back to us. On learning this, Warren thanked us and offered to drive us to Tallahassee to claim our prize. He even carefully got me to double-check that my ticket was in my purse. But halfway there, the car suddenly broke down, so the four of us got out and gave it a push. But as we started pushing, Warren suddenly sped away, leaving all of us standing there in shock. Where's your purse, Clarine? I left it in the car. That greedy snake Warren did this on purpose to run away with a ticket. Now what to do? Walk back home or walk to Tallahassee? Calm down. Danny already has a backup plan. This is the real ticket. Enjoy the view for now. A taxi is coming to pick us up. Actually, the moment Warren offered to drive us all the way to Tallahassee, I sent something sketchy. So I swapped the tickets. <sighs> My dad's gone too far this time. He needs to stop gambling and work hard to pay off his debts instead. Finally, we got the cash prize. However, the four of us decided not to divide it anymore. Instead, we're building a shelter for stray animals together. Surprisingly, our project soon reached many philanthropists and now our fund has been expanded across the US. Since then, Kirby is no longer obnoxious. Now she even wants to become a veterinarian. And me? I will continue to work my way into the law school of my dreams. My hard work has really paid off because they just sent me an acceptance letter. I might not be rich, but in all honesty, it doesn't matter, as I couldn't be happier. How long is this gonna take? So much for taking care of me. Lex, starting today, I'm locking your phone and laptop away. Cruel! Isn't one leg cast enough punishment? Excuse me, you don't deserve to have a say in this. If you hadn't bought our daughter that death trap motorbike in the first place, she'd still be intact. Yeah, sorry for making sure she doesn't grow up boring like her mom. Yeah, another lecture on how irresponsible I was eventually turned into a quarrel between mom and dad instead. They stopped only when mom needed to leave for her business trip in Egypt. I'm done arguing with you. I have a flight to catch. I've got my eye on you, young lady. All the way from Egypt? That's kinda hard. Well, at least dad's here, so I won't be by myself. The next morning, I woke up to see a note stuck to the fridge. Alex, I'm shooting my new movie in Spain for a few months. There is a strict no phone policy to avoid leaks. So if it isn't urgent, don't call me. Love, Dad. Seriously? Choosing work over me? Why am I still surprised? That's when you get when you have a world-famous actor dad and an award-winning photographer mom. They're rarely home, and whenever they are, they're constantly at each other's throats. All the more reason for me to hang out with my biker gang. I love motorcycles. They're my only getaway. But that's how I messed up my leg. In my defense, I could totally nail that trick and win their stupid bet if it wasn't for that bumpy road. However, not a single one of my homies has checked on me since then. Not even my boyfriend Blake. But what's really bumming me out is that school's out for summer, yet I can hardly move. So, bored out of my mind, I came up with a new way to entertain myself, which was playing candid camera on this whole suburbia. Thanks to my mom's camera, I had eyes on the newlyweds Cunninghams on the right, the Carpenters on the left, a few other houses, and ooh, tiny Timmy across the street. I swear to god, I almost thought some hunky guy had just moved in. My childhood friend Tiny Timmy had officially grown into Timothy. He looked just like a muscular version of Timothy Chalamet. 
Then Tim suddenly sat up and we accidentally made eye contact. Awkward. Looking good, handsome. He's even cuter when he smiles. Oh, he's replying. Even better up close. That's bold, Timmy. Too bad, though. Sorry, lame. Tim looks confused at first. Then when he saw my cast, he immediately leaves the room. Huh? A broken leg is enough to scare him off? He's lame. Then the doorbell rang. Hey, that took a while. You're here? Of course, you need to have a closer look. And could use a hand. Or a leg. Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> come help this damsel in distress. From then on, Tim came over every day to help me out around the house. He'd been really helpful and even tried riding my motorcycle so it didn't have to sit idle for too long. Other than that bulked up body, he's still the friend I knew back in the day. We still had so much fun playing video games and watching movies together. You have to watch Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. It's nuts. Actually, I thought you might be into Ladybird. Such a heartwarming coming-of-age story. Ew, no way. Timothy Chalamet is in it. Okay, sold. But how do you know that it'd sway me? I just do. Like how I know you spy on me from time to time, which, by the way, is super creepy. Yeah, right. As if he didn't intentionally leave his blinds open while working out, Mr. Shy Guy. One day, as usual, me and Tim were hanging out, when suddenly my dear boyfriend Blake made a noisy entrance. Babe, you won't believe this. There's a raising tournament going on in the Upper West Side. You have to come. What's going on here? Sup. What do you mean, sup? Who's this little brat? Oh, this is Tim. Tim, this is Blake. Say hi. Hi. I don't care. What do you think you're doing? Watch your tongue. You've been ignoring me for weeks, and now you show up raving on about some dumb street racing contest? You don't even remember that I broke my leg, do you? But, but, you're mine! Blake was fuming like a bull ready for battle and about to throw hands at Tim, but he stopped his fist midair. A defeated-looking Blake fled off as soon as he got out of Tim's grip. Coward. I apologized to Tim for dragging him into this mess, and he was surprisingly cool about it. Just curious, how did Blake and you become a thing? He's the leader of the biker gang, so I thought he was cool, but honestly, I never expected our relationship to last. Just like every other couple's. Exhibit A, my parents. I see. My dad's a good example as well. Then Tim revealed that his dad left his mom for another woman last year, which really upset him. I could relate so much to his situation. Maybe being locked up at home wasn't so bad after all, since we had the chance to catch up on everything. But the following morning, when I was chilling in my room, something horrible caught my eye. Something blonde. It looked like she was returning a hoodie to Tim. What kind of friend borrows a hoodie and acts like that around each other? Let's see what he has to say for himself. Who's that blonde? What was she doing at your place today? What? Who? She might look like strawberry shortcake, but don't be fooled. Whatever love you two might think you have will soon fade. That sweetness will turn sour in no time. Tim just burst out laughing. What's so funny? What made you think so? You don't even know Annabelle. <laughs> don't believe me? See for yourself. I then showed him all of the secrets I'd uncovered in our seemingly quiet neighborhood. First off, the couple from number 9 were both having affairs. The daughter from number 11 was using her boyfriend to hide her real relationship with another girl. And last but not least, the Carpenters, who seemed like suburban couples goal, actually had a far from blissful life due to Mr. Carpenter's drinking problem. In conclusion, there's no such thing as real love. I see your point, but on the other side of the spectrum, genuine love does exist. Tim points the camera towards the Cunninghams. Hmm, I'm not buying their poster couple act. Then, one day, Tim said he had to work overtime at the library to prepare for an event with, you guessed it, Annabelle only. I had to hide my anger as I watched him drive off with Blondie. With nothing else to do, I decided to watch the Cunninghams. Jeez, how could they seem so lovey-dovey all the time? I wanted to take my mind off of Tim, but the more I observed them, the more I thought about him with that Barbie. That's when I saw a book that Tim borrowed for me from the library. Looks like it's time to return it. I Ubered there, but there are many people here as well. Why did Tim say that the two of them would be here alone? Tim's face turned into the scream when he saw me. Didn't think I could get this far. Hi, don't mind me. I'm just here to return this. You should have just given it to me. 
Oh god, no. I can see that you're busy with... Annabelle, isn't it? Yeah. How do you know my name? Oh, let's see. You remind me of that creepy doll who's also an absolute nightmare. Tim then immediately dragged me away. See? He's caring for me, not you, Annie. However, the fun was interrupted right away when I saw Blake outside. Time for you to pay. Tim immediately stood between Blake and me, but to our surprise, Blake signaled for his goons hiding close by to show themselves. Clearly outnumbered, I tried to stop the situation from getting worse. Let's be civilized here. We can sort this out without violence. You're right, babe. We can settle this with a bet. Whoever can do the trick that broke Lex's leg and top it off with the Akira slide can have her fair and square. The loser has to back down. First of all, I'm not some kind of trophy. Second of all, that stunt is incredibly dangerous. Right, Tim? Sounds worth it, though. Have both of you lost your minds? Tim went first, and even though he flunked it, he managed to land without a scratch, while Blake landed on his face. Of course, that fiasco got the whole gang so embarrassed, they scrammed immediately. But I was still so annoyed. Congratulations, you won absolutely nothing. Not that I didn't care about him, I just couldn't stand his recklessness anymore. The next day, I was woken up by a doorbell. So, what are you here for? Sorry about last night. But if you stayed longer, I could have told you that I did what I did because I like you. Romantic styles. I don't even remember since when, but I do remember how sad I was when we stopped hanging out. Believe it or not, I started working out just to impress you. Whoa, what? Tim explained that nothing was going on between Annabelle and him. They were simply co-workers. And he made up that whole thing about being alone with her at the library to see my reaction. What do you say? I can make you believe in love. Tim, don't be ridiculous. Love isn't anything like the movies. It's merely a temporary chemical reaction in your brain that makes you think you're really feeling it. Come on, just give it a chance. No, look at my parents, your father, all the families in this neighborhood. If you ask me, your feelings for me right now will fade, just like mine with Blake. I'm sorry for wasting your time. I thought I was special enough for you to take a leap of faith. Now I know how wrong I was. He then left without another word. When Tim closed his blinds, honestly, I felt a sting in my chest. This is for the best, right? I can't deny the uneasiness I felt without Tim. It's not that he didn't want us to make up. I just didn't know how. Seeing how happy and smiley he was with her, my uneasy feeling only grew bigger. Is this what they call love? No, no, no. It's not real. Happy-looking families are not actually happy. And the Cunninghams are just good at faking it. What's that I'm hearing? Are they fighting? I saw the husband suddenly punch the wall with rage. Then push the wife. I no longer had eyes on them, but could hear a huge commotion over there. What on earth is going on? Panicked, I called the cops right away. Wait a second. That means their happy marriage really was fake. I excitedly limped across the street to tell Tim about my discovery, then dragged him over to the Cunningham's front lawn. However, when the cops arrived, both of them answered the door perfectly fine. Turns out they already knew about my spying, and were so annoyed by it, they decided to pull a prank on me. Great, my curious neighbors have also witnessed this whole humiliating ordeal. But the worst part was seeing the disappointment on Tim's face. You have to stop being so stubborn. Not every family is like yours. I couldn't say a word, not even when the cops gave me a warning. That night, I tossed and turned as Tim's words wiggled around my mind. Suddenly, something caught my attention. It's from Tim's house. Some flashlights were moving around. I tried calling Tim, but he didn't answer. Of course, he'd be in deep sleep by now. Calling the cops was useless because of that very recent embarrassing incident. That's it. I'm doing it myself. Out there on Tim's front lawn, my heart was beating like crazy. Thieves! Thieves! The startled thieves turned around, so I blared the air horn, then shouted. Freeze! Stay where you are! Hands over your heads! But, obviously, I, a teenager with one working leg, never actually expected any criminal to stand still. They quickly got a hold of me, and right when I thought my life was over... Get away from her! Tim, thank goodness! Other neighbors also came and stopped the thieves. Tim called the cops and this time they reported to the scene ASAP. 
Phew, that was insane. Mrs. Jones, Tim's mom, thanked me and invited me to stay the night. It's really nice of her, even though she burst out laughing when I explained the situation with the Cunninghams. When Tim went to grab some drinks for us, she asked me why I was alone in this condition. So, I spilled everything about my family. Contrary to her reaction just now, she showed me sympathy. From her experience, love didn't always have a happy ending, but it doesn't mean it's not real. Tim's dad and I had genuine feelings for each other. It's just that over time, things changed. We're open to accept this and be honest with each other. That's what real love is. I wouldn't change a thing and I would still fall crazily in love with him, despite knowing we would eventually break up. Because that's how I got Tim, the second real love of my life. Her words hit different. Maybe I'd given love a bad name. You're right, love is not at fault. And Tim is so lucky to have a loving mom like you. Meanwhile, my parents don't just hate each other, they put it all on me too. Bet you, even tonight's incident won't make them care. I see where you're coming from, but why don't you just give it a try? Their reactions might surprise you. So, I called them up, and guess what? They both sounded concerned on the phone and said they'd come home as soon as they could. See, I told you so. It's alright now. Timmy, please show Lex where she'll be sleeping. That was really brave of you. Being all heroic out there despite your whole situation... I wouldn't have risked my life if it wasn't for... If it wasn't for what? I'm all ears. For you. I'm sorry I overreacted. The thought of becoming a boring old couple who hate each other bugged me. But then I realized if we were together, we wouldn't have to be that. We could be like the Cunninghams. That doesn't sound too bad now, does it? I guess not. Next morning, I woke up to my parents' call. They actually kept their promise this time. My mom explained that she thought dad was home to take care of me, while dad absentmindedly assumed mom only left in a fit of anger and was going to return soon. So they really do care about me. They just have a terrible way of showing it. They stayed together, thinking it would be best for me. But the unending tension and bickering was eating us all up from the inside. This incident opened their eyes, so they agreed to have a peaceful divorce while still looking after me together. I'm finally free from the cast. But I actually feel even more liberated than before. Is this the power of my newfound belief in love? Is it because I've realized that love was around me all along? I'm not sure myself, but who cares? Alex and Timothy signing off. How is it possible that I've never set foot in a place this close to me before? It's kind of dark and eerie. If only it was covered in flowers, then it'd totally be a Disney castle. Oh, someone's here. I went to say hi, but she didn't seem very welcoming. Stay away from this spooky place before it sucks the life out of you, young girl. So that means you're not working here anymore? The maid just shook her head before she hurried off. Here comes my chance. Hey guys, Joe Casta here. And this Dracula-esque castle is none other than Mr. Joseph Williams. Are you wondering who that is? Hmm, I'm curious too. All I know about him is that he's my parents' creditor, and I'm here to ask him to extend the deadline for their debt. But as one of his mates just quit, I could work here to pay off the debt instead, right? Hello, I'm Jocasta, your new maid. No answer. Should I just come in? If anything, the master should blame the old maid for leaving the gates open. So I had to find my own way inside. Hello? I'm the new maid. Master, are you here? No? Not here. Not here either. Is he still sleeping at this hour? Oh, there he is. Huh? He's not old and gray like I thought he'd be. I introduced myself, then he returned to his painting, and coldly said, Work off your debt? Fine. Let's see how long you'll last. Just keep in mind, don't ever make me angry. Oh, master, you're worrying over nothing. I wouldn't even care about you. But turns out, he wasn't worrying over nothing. He's actually infuriatingly difficult. The curtains must remain drawn during nighttime. There must be absolutely no noise at all, and his bedroom is strictly forbidden. Who gave you permission to sit there? Oops, I forgot. I must keep a distance of ten feet from him at all times, even during meals. Phew, finally it's time to rest. Though I've been working here for a couple of days, I'm still not used to Master Joseph's ridiculous rules. Huh? What's that staring at me? Ah! Rat! There's a rat! Help! What on earth are you shrieking about at this hour? You dare to disturb my sleep? Master, save me! There it is! It's coming! He stood bravely like a warrior, ready to fight the beast. Look at his broad shoulders, his hair, his chiseled face, and... 
His every movement is so smooth. That hideous rat was finally running scared. What a relief! You're making a fuss over nothing. Move to another room tomorrow. This one is too shabby. Looking closely, my fastidious master looks kind of handsome, doesn't he? Well, living here isn't so bad now that I've got the hang of his rules. <laughs> Bring me a cup of tea. Yes, master. Here you go. Pass it to me. Huh? Are we off social distancing now? I excitedly handed him the cup of tea, but he missed it and tea spilled all over him. Clumsy dummy! Can't you look at what you're doing? I hurriedly wiped the stain on his clothes and apologized profusely, but he roared again. Stop! How dare you come this close to me! Get out! Jeez, his temperament changed like the seasons. Hot, cold, hot, cold. Whatever. I'll just go home then. Indeed, no place like home. Oh, how comfy. I told Judy, my bestie, about my week working in the castle. Interested? Wanna come with me someday? No, no, no chance. Haven't you seen anything unusual there? Then Judy said rumor had it that a mad scientist once lived there. And werewolves too. As horrible howls could be heard during a full moon. You have to be careful. There's a reason why no one goes there. Oh no, it's today. Wolves howling under the moon? Never mind, Judy is just being childish. Who still believes in such fiction? Definitely not me. So, ta-da, I'm back again. Honestly, I need this job. I can't let him fire me, even if I have to cling to his leg and beg, but where is he? Should I? I opened the door to see him lying there, surrounded by dull paintings, while tools scattered everywhere. What happened? I tried lifting him, nudged him. Still, he wouldn't come around. Then suddenly, his eyes opened. Hey, the ten-foot rule doesn't apply because that was an emergency. Have you eaten anything since yesterday? As I thought, if you still want to kick me out now, you'll have nothing to eat. After that incident, Joseph seemed more at ease. He stopped threatening me with his rules and just let me ramble on. One time, when I was napping on the couch after cleaning, he even put a blanket on me. <laughs> I haven't slept yet, dear master. Then one day, a middle-aged woman appeared at the gate. She introduced herself as Joseph's mom and gifted him a beautiful bird. But she didn't come inside and just sarcastically said, Oh, my son's got a new mate again. This weird boy. So sorry for you, poor girl. I brought the bird to Joseph, excitedly told him that his mom just dropped by. Look what lovely present she got you. Lovely? That woman's just mocking me. I'm stuck in this place like a bird in a cage. I think it's a thoughtful gift. You seem to like painting birds. Stop prying. This is none of your business. Okay, I'm sorry. But it's your own choice to isolate yourself from the outside world. Come with me. I have something special to show you. Oh, this place is still as gorgeous as the first time I came here. Looks like Joseph is mesmerized too. See? The world is beautiful. You just need to look. We were walking along the blooming flower path. Then suddenly... He's coming! The wolf! Wolf! Then all the gardeners immediately scrammed in panic. What have I done to you, you morons? Beautiful, you say? Then Joseph stormed off. I tried to catch him, but... Ouch! I tripped over a rock. Oh, it hurts! It freaking hurts! Then let me apply the antiseptic cream. No, that will only make it worse. Maybe doing something fun could ease the pain. I'll be distracted from this. Please, can we watch a movie? And of course, he couldn't refuse. Oops. Awkward. Clearly, I didn't think it through when picking this rom-com. Wonder what my master is thinking. Oh gosh, there's no need to be that emotional. His scary appearance startled me. Eyes turned white, mouth snarled, as if he wanted to eat me alive. I tried to stay calm to ask him what was going on, but Joseph was like a madman, frantically smashing things and howling. Stop, Joseph, please don't do it. Ah, my arm. Realizing that he just hurt me, Joseph seemed to regain his senses. He then ran off in a panic. I quickly hugged him. It's okay, it's okay, calm down. Once he'd felt better, he started telling me his biggest secret. Since childhood, he'd had difficulty controlling his emotions, which often led to outbursts of anger. Later on, the moon also triggered this reaction after his stepfather passed away on a full moon night, and it then became traumatizing, because Joseph feared he'd been the cause of his death. That was also the cause of the tension between him and his mother. I think I was born with this strange condition. As a child, my stepfather used to give me some medicine to keep it under control. His stepfather used to give him pills? Judy also mentioned the mad scientist who used to live here. Is that... 
Hmm, I have to figure it out. One night, I sneaked into the room that Joseph forbade me to enter. On rummaging around, I found a tape that showed me the whole terrifying plan of his stepfather to regularly give Joseph a power-boosting pill as an experiment, and also to take him to the mountains to test out some new crazy invention. What on earth was that? But I can't tell Joseph right away. He needs to be mentally stable first. So I started off by taking him out for a walk, and when he felt comfortable enough, I suggested we go downtown together for some grocery shopping. He was just like a hedgehog, prickling up every time someone accidentally touched him. But, of course, I know how to tame this hot headmaster, just like this. There you go. Then we started tidying and redecorating the whole castle to liven up the mood of this place. When we got to the last room, his stepfather's, he seemed a bit hesitant. It's been so long. This room also needs cleaning, else the furniture may become damaged. Do you know anything about your stepfather's videos? Uh, how do you know? Then Joseph searched for a memory card, then gave it to me. I was so scared that I hid it and never dared look at it. I wanted to destroy it once, but on second thought, it contains the last images of my stepdad, so I've always kept it here. Huh? This wasn't what I meant. So there's another video apart from the ones I saw. This may shed light on everything. If you don't mind, can I watch that video? I'm quite curious. From that day, we never spoke of the videos again. Instead, we went for walks, cooked, and meditated together. And today's schedule is this art exhibition. Look at his surprised face. <laughs> they look familiar, right? Don't tell me you don't recognize your own artwork. It seems that each painting tells a story. I can't wait to know who the artist is. They must be an experienced and profound person. I knew it. These compliments will help him erase his own self-doubts. Back from the exhibition, we noticed a delicious smell coming from the dining room. Who could that be? It was Joseph's mother. Joseph seemed surprised by his mom's presence, but I wasn't, because I was the director behind the scene. In fact, I secretly asked her to organize that exhibition. Watching the video cleared everything up. On that moonlit night, the mad scientist took Joseph to the mountains to test the effects of a super power-boosting concoction. But when he saw Joseph reacting abnormally, he panicked and ran away, so the accident happened. It wasn't Joseph's fault. He was, in fact, a victim. I told Joseph's mom the truth beforehand, which led to this touching reconciliation. Now that things were clear as day, they have untied the knot in their hearts. His mother decided to move here to help him overcome his trauma of the moon with me. Oh, he also told me about the time he dropped a teacup on purpose as an excuse to push me away so that I'd be safe. How sweet and caring he is. Oh shoot, who left this curtain open? I hurried over to close it, when suddenly a hand gently touched mine. Before you came, I really never thought I'd ever have the courage to face moonlight. But Jocasta, with you by my side now, anything feels possible. Hey, I'm Madison, and I was born into a well-off family. My parents are successful entrepreneurs who always fulfill their dearest daughter's wishes. Beautiful face, supermodel figure, I have both. But unfortunately, I'm not the only one. I have a limelight-hogging twin sister, Olivia. Since elementary school, my sister has won loads of trophies for her singing. Everyone was so spellbound by her that they seemed to completely forget about me. And it didn't help when mom dressed us the same. Meanwhile, dad was always like, Whoa, I can barely tell my two princesses apart. Maddie, if your sister is tied up with her singing, you could help fill in her place in class. <laughs> Ugh, it's not funny. At all! Especially when that kind of came true. Later at 14, when I was still trying to figure out what today's homework was, my sister went and won The Voice Kids. At school, everyone kept giving me gifts and praises just to walk off on me as soon as they realized I wasn't Olivia. Hey, it's not like I intentionally tricked them. Trust me, I'm just as sick and tired of all this as everyone else, so I decided to take action. Ta-da! Did you recognize me? Still Madison here. The one-of-a-kind Madison with pixie hair, smoky eyes, nude lipstick, and this edgy outfit. I look different, right? But... Oh, are you cosplaying Olivia and her upcoming MV? Madison, you're ruining your sister's image! I tried to be different from her, but it couldn't change the fact that I'm the twin sister of a famous singer. There's so many things I wanted to do. But just imagine if I tried out for the cheerleading team or a modeling contest. People would be... Look at the tragic Olivia wannabe. <sighs> The name Olivia gradually became something that haunted me, and now she's constantly gaining in fame while I remain in her shadow. 
I have my own dream of becoming a model too, and I've gone to every audition I could. But so far, no luck. Oh right, let's check out my new video. Maybe YouTube will be the Kickstarter for my rise to fame. Remember to remove your makeup thoroughly, and the last step is subscribe to my channel to stay updated with the latest makeup trends. It's only been 10 hours, but look at this. There are over 200,000 views and 1,000 comments. Yay! Let's see. Like if you watch this just because you thought this was Olivia. When you're boring, but you have a famous sister. Olivia, you're the goat. Please reply to my comment. What on earth is going on here? No one talked about the video content. It's all about Olivia. Why can't I get rid of that name? I am Madison. Frustrated, I closed the laptop to leave, but turned around to see the mean girls surrounding me. Silly, you should have titled it Skincare Tips from Olivia's Sister. There would have been millions of views by now. Someone with no talent like you should just stay in the dark. Please. Shut up. Just wait. One day y'all gonna become my fans too. Finally. What a long day. But isn't every beginning tough? Me quitting would be exactly what those mean girls wanted, so I can't give up now. I was struggling to set up my camera when mom opened the door and peeked in. You've started a YouTube channel? Why not ask your sister to help promote it? Ah, uh, but no worry. Everyone can obviously see that you're Olivia's sister. You'll probably receive a gold button soon anyway. Ugh, what do you know? I don't even need her help. And please stop entering my room without knocking. Nobody acknowledges my effort just because I look like her. Fine then, just wait and see. In two more months, I'll be 18 and be able to do one thing I've been dreaming of. That will put an end to all this unfairness I had to suffer. This is it, the moment I've been waiting for. Right here, right now, I'll be reborn. I'm ready to start my life anew. You can open your eyes and look at yourself, Ms. Lewis. <sighs> okay, three, two, one. O-M-G in the mirror. A beautiful face, a stranger. Not like Olivia's or anyone I ever know. Finally, I can live my life with my famous sister out of my way. Hmm, I wonder how my parents would react to this face that I myself don't even recognize. Hey, I'm home. Hello, but who are you? It's Madison, aren't you? What happened? Did you get plastic surgery? Plastic surgery? Didn't you say you were on vacation with your friends? Your beautiful face. Why did you? You mean Olivia's beautiful face. I'm done living in her shadow. Then I ran straight to my room, leaving them there all stunned. The next morning at school, all the girls' curious eyes were on me. And the boys? Needless to say, people were buzzing around. But there was no Olivia nor Madison to be heard. Nobody recognized me. I am the one and only now. Hey, Angel. Are you lost? Let me show you around. Since when did this mean girl become so friendly? You moving here is the right decision. Our school is the best in the state. Boring. If it weren't for my parents' new investment in this area, I wouldn't be at this shabby place. This fame-seeking silly girl instantly bought my bluffing. Her eyes widened, looking at me like a puppy. Then she did everything I asked her to. Buying me sodas, carrying my bag for me, and even wiping my seat. <laughs> Suddenly, Alicia walked over and nudged Zara. Where have you been? I told you to get me a latte. And who's she? Oh, this is my new bestie. And you should go get your latte yourself, as I'll be busy showing my friend here around, right? Alicia's frown face was a picture. <laughs> what a solid friendship these mean girls have. But the fun had only just begun. As the teacher did a roll call, I raised my hand up at the sound of Madison Lewis. The whole class gasped. And you betcha, Alicia and Zara's bewildered faces were hilarious. Didn't see that coming, huh? By recess, the whole school had heard the breaking news. Me, Madison, just got plastic surgery. Some were showering me with flattery, while some just kept judging the size of my eyes or my nose bridge, blah, blah, blah. But no one compared me to Olivia anymore. They just forgot about my famous twin sister. That's all I need. Madison is unique. Ouch! What's wrong with you? Are you blind? It was you going the wrong way, Madison. Um, he looks so familiar, but I still can't think of his name. He's... It's Dylan. Have you seriously forgotten my name already? That's right. My old neighbor, Dylan. His family must have moved back to town again. But how could you recognize me right away? You look a bit different, but I can still tell from your voice. Forget the past. I'm the new Madison, the best version of Madison. Then I walked away from him. Now I'm finally free to do whatever I want without being compared to Olivia.
I easily got that cheerleading captain title. From this spot, I can see all the impressed spectators and Zara's look of fury. <laughs> she was the former captain who got dethroned by me. Then I went on and won the school beauty contest too. Alicia's boyfriend, Sid, even dumped her to chase after me. Who's the loser now, girl? But of course, a jerk like him didn't interest me, so I bluntly rejected him in front of everyone. One afternoon while I was going home, Sid jumped out of nowhere and blocked my way. Babe, girls are lining up to date me, but I picked you. Be my girl and you'll see. Come on, just one dinner. Let go of me! Suddenly a big looking guy rushed in, scared Sid off, and then offered to take me home. He introduced himself as Isaac, and turns out we were in the same chemistry class. Oh god, how come I never noticed this handsome boy? Probably chemistry had sucked the life out of me every time I entered that lab room, but it's okay. We can rebuild our chemistry here now. After that day, we texted each other all of the time, and a week later we became an item. Fast, yes, but when you know, you know. Isaac took care of me during workouts, waited in the salon for hours, and even kept me updated with fashion trends. He's just perfect. But one time, when we walked hand in hand at the mall, I caught sight of Dylan's cold face. I suddenly felt awkward and tried to avoid his gaze. Strange. But why bother? Isaac and I were too busy discussing our upcoming plans anyway. I finally released my second video, and no one mentioned Olivia. But Gigi, Bella, Lily Maymac? Now they're seeing me like those hot girls? Ridiculous! And talk kept coming about how I look like other stars. Maybe she brought their photos and asked the surgeon to copy them, but no way can Replica compete with the original. Still, isn't it better to resemble your own sibling than being some stranger's copycat? <laughs> so, did I really look like a carbon copy of someone else? Again? I rush to Isaac. He's the only one I can trust. Uh, just a little, babe. But if you don't like it, there's always a way. So I continued to undergo many other surgeries to find the perfect, unique Madison. Isaac was always there to encourage me. He was the one who suggested what part I should fix next. Sharper jawline, thinner nose, fuller lips. He has an eye for this, right? Seems like your eyes still need some fixing. I'll take you there next week. More? I know Isaac only wanted the best for me, but after pouring my fortune on endless plastic surgeries, I was completely broke, and no way would my parents agree to lend me some. Why not ask Isaac, you wonder? I can't do that. I'm not a gold digger. The surgery appointment was coming up, but I still couldn't gather enough money. What to do? What's wrong? Fighting with your guy? Desperate to offload, I blurted out my problem. So, could you help me out? I'll pay you back as soon as possible. I don't know why you think you need all this surgery. If Isaac really loved you, no way would he make you do this. Let me knock some sense into this dude. Dylan seemed so mad. I tried to pull his hand, but to no avail. Thank goodness someone blocked him. That's Olivia. I don't know what she said, but Dylan calmed down and went inside. Then Olivia walked towards me. You're already so pretty, Madison. Don't mind what others say. You guys don't know me at all. I'd rather be weirdly ugly than be pretty, but look the same as someone else. I don't want to be a copy of anyone. Then I stormed off immediately. Waking up after a restless night, I was reaching my phone to call Isaac, then saw an envelope of money on the nightstand. Is this from Olivia? Why did she... Never mind. No time to think, else I'm going to be late for my appointment. Look, my face has healed just in time for my graduation ceremony. Pretty, huh? But I haven't been able to bring myself to be happy at all, as it's been over a month since Isaac ghosted me. After the eye surgery that day, Isaac insisted I have my nose fixed too. I said I needed more time to recover, but he got annoyed and just left. I've been looking forward to this graduation, which is compulsory for everyone, so he won't be able to avoid me anymore. My parents came too, but probably for Olivia, and today's spotlight is definitely hers. Suddenly, the crowd surrounding my sister gravitated to something else. Hang on, Isaac? Oh. My. God. Standing next to him is a girl who looks exactly like me! And her dress is identical to the one Isaac once gave me. I rushed over to confront him, but he flung me away. Wow, how buzzing! Both the real deal and the knockoff are here. Can you even tell them apart, Isaac? Stop saying nonsense. My princess is the one and only. Hey, you really do look a lot like me. Who are you? So after countless surgeries, I was still a doppelganger? All I want is just to be myself, to be unique. Why is it so hard? I felt rage filling up my body. I ran to the restroom to calm myself down, but it didn't help because I overheard the truth. 
Isaac and Naomi broke up when she moved abroad with her family. Guess she's back now. Yeah, how much he must love her to do all this. Great, now I get it. Isaac only wanted me to get plastic surgery to look like Naomi. But once his ex is back, he threw me away like a broken toy. So the gossip girls at school are definitely not missing out on this chance to mock me. Girls, stop! My sister, it's you who needs to stop. Don't you know you're the cause of everything? Calm down, Madison. It's completely normal to look like someone. To me, and to your family, you've always been the one and only Madison. No! I've never been seen as the only one! Then I told Dylan everything I'd bottled up inside. Why I absolutely needed plastic surgery. Why I was so obsessed with the fact that I resembled my sister. Everybody had always thought of me merely as Olivia's shadow. I never knew that's how you felt. I'm sorry, Madison. We are such bad parents. Startled, I turned around to see everyone. Madison, I've never looked down on you. I only thought I could use my reputation to make things easier for you. We always try to do the best we can for you two. We thought this change in appearance was what you wanted. If only we'd realized the painful reason behind it. Oh, wow. They actually cared this much about me? I cried even louder and ran straight into their open arms. Maybe Dylan was right. Maybe I really am special just for who I am, not for what I look like. The next day, I went to school to clear out my locker. High school is over. Now I can shake off all the bad memories I had here. Let's start things anew. Oh, finally found you. Um, Naomi, right? I, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to copy you. I didn't know. It's all right. I know it wasn't your fault. I swear, I had no idea Isaac was that much of a jerk. I immediately dumped him and exposed him online. How could he think us girls are just replaceable items? He even had the cheek to cry and beg me. But men like him don't ever deserve to be near us. I thought you'd be angry with me. For what? Madison, I'm truly sorry for what you had to go through. But everything has a bright side to it, don't you think? What do you think about having another twin sister? My dream of becoming a star on a runway has finally come true. But the most amazing thing was finding a companion with the same passion as me, who's none other than my new identical twin, Naomi. Bet no one can tell us apart. Miss Madison Lewis, would you go on a date with me after this? Oh, but I'm Naomi. Don't ever think you can fool me, Madison. You've always been different in my eyes. Hi, Melanie here, and I'm hanging on the edge of my seat to hear the results of this year's science fair. I know I might not look like a typical studious girl, but I'm definitely serious about school. Ooh, one second. The winner of West High Science Fair 2023 is Harry Silver. That means the runner-up is Melanie D'Angelo. Congratulations to you both. Please come onto the stage for your awards. Man, I can't believe I'm second to him again. We'd been literally swapping first and second place on every leaderboard since we were kids. Ugh, so unfair. Look at him. All he did was partying and pulling silly pranks, yet he's still on the honor roll, while I had to study day and night to maintain my straight A's. Mmm, mom's taking quite long. What's that commotion over there? This calls for a celebration. What do you guys think? Olive Garden? Yes. yes! Jeez, can you keep it down just a smidge? Come to think of it, people like Harry just have it all, while I only have mom by my side. Oh, she came just in time! Dad left us for another woman a while ago, so my mom had been struggling every day being a single mom. She must be really sad and lonely, so I'd never mention Dad anymore. Poor her. The more I felt for Mom, the angrier I was at Dad. Only my bestie, Izzy, knew about this, cause, you know, it's hard to open up when you're from a broken home. Luckily, there's one thing in this world that could raise my spirits, as well as my heartbeat, in these dark, gloomy days. My dreamy crush, Cameron. Last year of middle school was coming to an end, so I gotta make a move with Cameron fast. The problem was, every time I got close to him, that party pooper appeared out of nowhere to make fun of me. He kept calling me melanin, cause that's what you lack, and bothered me nonstop. We had never gotten along, but seriously, what's wrong with him lately? He picked on me way too much, and why only me? I can't believe everyone thinks he's a model student. To me, Harry's no more than the most annoying bug. All right. Hair, makeup, pearly white teeth, check. I'm giving it another go today, waiting for Cameron at his locker with my love letter in hand. As soon as I saw his gorgeous face, I took a deep breath and put up the sweetest smile, but all of a sudden, someone messed up my hair from behind. Ow! 
Ouch! I turned around to see the culprit. Harry, you look hot. And it generates electricity, too. Now you can charge your phone with your hair. Thank me later. <laughs> oh, my God. Nobody should see this Medusa hairdo. My plan to confess failed again before it even started. All thanks to that clown, Harry. Wait, isn't that my dad? He was walking out of the principal's office with a much younger woman and a boy my age. From what I gathered, they're saying that his son would go here. Seeing how my dad's starting a new life with his new family, I couldn't help but feel sorry for mom. This is all that woman's fault. If she just disappeared, things could go back to the way they were. But that's merely a wish, and me and mom just have to put up with this boring, unhappy life day by day. Voodoo for dummies? Was some higher power listening to me? This sounds like an answer to my problem. I ordered the book immediately. I started studying all kinds of spells and rituals in it as soon as the package arrived. Voodoo dolls? Interesting. The next day, I went to find Izzy ASAP. Hey, I'm thinking of using a voodoo doll on my dad's new wife to bring my parents back together. What do you think? Does it really work? I don't think. Yo, Wednesday. Sorry. <clears throat> Yo, knock off Wednesday. <laughs> Harry Silver, you are so dead. But wait a second. You know what? We can test it out. Harry would be the perfect guinea pig. What? Him? He's just being his playful self. What if voodoo actually works? Harry doesn't deserve it. Well, I don't think so. Let's make a doll for our little preppy boy then. Crocheting a doll's easy. However, the tricky thing was getting my subject's hair, and you bet I won't get physically close to Harry even if someone pays me to. So I got this, a Ouija board. It will help me figure out the code for his locker. There must be a few strands stuck on the fancy hairbrush that he kept inside. Ugh, but none of the combos worked. This is the tenth time already. How about this? There we go. But there were only books inside. Ah, uh, boring. Then the soccer team's changing room it is. I will definitely find something on his uniform. Let's see. Harry, silver. There it is. Aha, gotcha. I was about to flee the scene when I suddenly saw a boy with only a towel around his waist. Ah! I sprinted to the door and dashed straight through the hallway. That was close. Okay, I still had a voodoo doll to finish. And it's done. I excitedly show Izzy last night's work. Pretty good, huh? It has Harry's hair, too. What? How do you know it's really Harry's? What if it's somebody else's? Well, I... I... Hey, did you hear some perv with panda eyes was creeping around the boys' changing room yesterday? Go away. But don't worry. Starting today, we'll take turns guarding the entrance to catch them. Oh, what a coincidence. You fit the culprit's description perfectly, melanin. But you're definitely not that pervy, are you? <laughs> I was so mad, I felt smoke coming out of my ears. I wish my gaze could kill that brat. Mel, you're squeezing the doll's arm. It's gonna come off. Whoops, my bad. Next time I saw Harry, he had bandages all over his right arm. Hang on, did I do that? Feeling guilty and curious, I approached him. Hey, what's wrong with your arm? It's been in pain since yesterday for no reason. My doctor said nothing's wrong, but I kept feeling like someone's squeezing it really hard. Ugh, there it goes again. Oh, spooky. It means the doll is truly magical. I immediately came running to tell Izzy, and of course, she was shocked too. But hold up, nosy Artie? How long has he been standing here? This guy clearly had heard everything. He kept reaching for my doll. No way. He'd tell the whole school about it. Then suddenly, Harry sat down next to me. Melanie, my arm hurts. Feed me. Uh... What's he pulling now? Can't he see I'm in the middle of something? Right at that moment, Artie snatched my doll. Leave it to me. No, Artie, no! Not with milk in his mouth. Oops, sorry, I felt so nauseous all of a sudden. That was more than enough to make all of us firm believers. But maybe I should stop. I do feel guilty for dragging Harry into this. That afternoon, when I was about to throw the doll in the trash can, I saw Cameron walk towards me. Did Christmas come early? Hey, I was wondering if you're... Yes, I've been waiting so long for this day. An occultist? What? I mean, Artie was going off about a voodoo doll of yours, so I thought you might know a thing or two about love spells. But if that's not true, I'm sorry. Um, what do you need a love spell for? Then he revealed he wanted to put a spell on his crush, Regina. So all this time, I had no chance with him at all? But hey, a love spell sounds like a brilliant idea. It could ensure my parents' reunion too. Sure thing, but I'll need your hair as well as Regina's. Also, some of your personal items for the spell to work. 
Obviously, I'll use his stuff, but in a love spell for me. And you know what I gave him? It's all junk with some of my poodle's fur. <laughs> a few days later, I found a gift box in my locker from Cameron. My spell worked. I'm about to have a boyfriend and reunite my family. But before I could carry out that long-awaited plan, Artie came to me with a difficult request, making a voodoo doll of Brad, some transfer student who already established himself as a vicious tough guy. That sounds dangerous, and I already promised myself not to use voodoo anymore. Don't believe me? See for yourself. Then, I followed him and witnessed another student being picked on by a much bigger guy. Hey, isn't he Dad's stepson? Okay, this Brad guy deserves it. So I agreed to help Artie. The next day, I approached Brad after class where he usually messed with other students. I managed to sneak up behind him and get one strand of hair. Oh no, busted. I quickly put the hair in the doll. This better work. Come on! Why isn't it working? And why now? Pesky little thing. Stop! Stop. I know those voices. Thank goodness. Touch her and you'll regret it. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call the police. Brad just scoffed and left. Phew, what are you both doing here? And Harry, I thought your arm hurt. Then Harry and Izzy finally told me that voodoo had never been effective. Izzy knew that Harry only picked on me because he liked me? That's why she tried to stop me from using voodoo on him. But she couldn't, so she then told Harry everything. To be honest, I found your attempts quite amusing, so I acted like they were successful to humor you and myself. I was gonna stop, though, but when you were being sweet to me and asked about my arm, I decided to keep it up. Oh. My. God. My bestie had been friends with my mortal enemy all along. Behind my back? Am I a joke to you? Why are you here? To make fun of me even more than you already did? Because I got worried when I heard you're going after Brad. Melanie, you're the smartest girl in school. I don't understand why you're doing all these dumb gimmicks. Yeah, you've been acting strange lately. Since when are you superstitious? What other choice do I have? Voodoo or at whatever cost? I need to get my parents back together. And that punk Brad is my dad's stepson. He deserves whatever comes to him for ruining my life. And you know what else? Both of you get out of my sight for good! Then I stormed off. After that day, I no longer talked to Izzy, and Harry's relentless pestering finally stopped. But honestly, it felt a bit empty without them, especially with the upcoming school field trip. Of course, I'm still coming. Who needs them anyway? This is the chance for Cameron and I to be closer now that we're talking on the regs. It's gonna be the best trip ever. I've never been the outdoorsy type, but does camping involve this many physical tasks? Almost done. What on earth is that? Isn't he under my love spell already? I mean, he even gave me a present. I was still in shock when Cameron came over to help with the tent. Thank you. No need to. I can't thank you enough. That spell of yours worked wonders. What does he mean by that? Then, out of nowhere, Izzy tapped on my shoulder. I've tried to tell you. Those two have been flirting for a while now. I guess Cameron just needed your spell as a little spiritual push. That means none of these has ever worked? There's absolutely no hope of bringing my family back? Feeling devastated, I burst into tears and ran off. I was running without looking and bumped into... Brad? Melanie, right? Just who I want to see. Or should I say, my dear stepsister, your mama sent you here. Let go of me and piss off. <laughs> I wonder how pathetic she had to be to have her husband walk out on her. <laughs> if this was any other time, I would have fought back. But after all that just happened, I've lost all of my will to do anything now. Out of the blue, I saw someone charge at Brad and land a brutal blow on his face. I said I'd make you regret touching her. I had to stop Harry before he messed Brad's face up beyond recognition. It's time we got out of here. Why did you come help me after everything I said? I'm kinda used to your coldness. Besides, my love language is following you around and teasing you until you notice or get mad at me. Silly. I know. On a different note, I thought you knew that voodoo was useless. Yeah, so I thought of a love spell to get my parents back together. Then my family will be whole and happy again. But I know it now. There's no such thing as magic. Why not? Magic is alive and well inside you, and it is called forgiving. It cannot punish those who hurt you and your loved ones, but it can help you let go of your pains and sufferings. What are you trying to say? I mean, no magic can make your dad come back, but someday the pain he caused you won't ache anymore. Eventually, your mom and you will heal and lead a fulfilling life without him. I never took this goofy guy for the philosophical and mature type, but I guess he's right. I'd been so caught up in my own bitterness that I didn't realize 
moving on was an option. When my mom picked me up, I decided to finally ask her about my dad. Unexpectedly, mom told me that of course it was sad at first, but she's actually doing fine these days. Life's supposed to have its ups and downs. As long as we welcome them with open arms, everything will turn out all right in the end. After all, your father will have the life he wants while we get on with our lives. Turned out, I was the only one chasing the past all this time when what I actually needed was closure. Mom's words were more than enough to put this grieving period behind me. My last year as a middle schooler was quite eventful. Brad was no longer a problem since he got a taste of Harry's fist. Did I mention that we became a trio of best friends? For now, at least. Harry never stopped his shenanigans, but instead of getting annoyed like before, I found him quite adorable and endearing. Oh, just kiss already? Izzy! Aha! A snowstorm's coming! Perfect for a race. Let's go, my loyal soldiers! Looks like a big storm, guys. Shall we head home? Scared already? Cowards! I was born and raised in the snow. This is nothing. Then I signaled for Bam and Holly to speed up, but they stopped and barked nonstop instead. Is that pile of snow moving? I hurriedly ran over to check. OMG! It's a boy! No, an angel with blonde hair. My heart was racing. Is this love at first sight? H help me. No matter how much Eldon and Era objected, I insisted on bringing this guy back to my place. I had to take care of him myself. Oh, looks like he'd woken up. Are you okay? Where am I? You're in my house. I'm Brenna, by the way. I found- Oh, God. Huh? What's wrong? Something on my face? Um, no. It's just that you're too beautiful. Like a real-life Snow White. Then he said his name's Beavis. He came here to travel, but unfortunately was met by the snowstorm. Yeah, it's gonna snow heavily in the next couple of days, so you should stay here until you recover. After a few days, Beavis got better, so I showed him around. On the sledge. Although Bam and Holly were practically just walking, Beavis still freaked out so much, he huddled up against me. <laughs> Hold on tight! I'm speeding up! We went up a hill, then through a pine forest and arrived at, ta-da, probably the biggest frozen lake he had ever seen. I taught Beavis how to drill a hole in the ice, then he excitedly dropped the fishing line. The following days, I continued taking him sightseeing, and we were basically inseparable. We went to see polar bears kayaking among the icebergs. I taught him how to make instant snow by spraying boiling water into the cold air, and we even watched the spectacular auroras together. Wow, I've never seen such beautiful scenery before. Yeah, and I'd never seen such a beautiful face before. Just like that, Beavis spent day after another with me here in the Arctic. It's been so much fun, but for some reason, my friends Eldon and Era were not having any of it. They seemed to hold grudges against him or something. One time when I was arranging supplies in the root cellar, I heard Beavis's ear-piercing scream. I hurriedly checked and saw a white fox dashing out, followed by giggles outside the window. You're such a chicken, big city boy. It's just an extra large kitty. Then Eldon and Era burst into laughter. Ugh, can those two show a little hospitality? At dinner, I cooked him my signature dish as an apology to Beavis for those naughty friends of mine. He was totally cool about it and even told me stories about his friends back at home and about their lives in Florida. Whoa, it sounds so magical. I wish I could lounge around on a beach and soak up the sun while enjoying my coconut drink too. I went to sleep dreaming about the beautiful urban life. Suddenly, a knock on my bedroom door woke me up. I stumbled to answer it and saw Beavis. Hey, Brenna, could you take me to the toilet? It's too dark outside and that fox might come back. <laughs> How cute! He's really good at coming up with excuses to be with me. While waiting for Beavis, I planned out what we're going to do tomorrow. As he got back from the outhouse, ooh, I couldn't contain my excitement and told him right away. Uh, <clears throat> hey, I'm all better now. Maybe it's time for me to go home. Huh? Why so sudden? I'm sorry, but I really can't take this anymore. No, how could my first love end this fast? It hasn't even started. Brenna, it's so tough for me to live here. I don't want to boil ice every time I need a cup of water or go to the toilet out in the freezing cold. And how tiring that we can only go around on sleds. But even if we had a car, there's literally nowhere to go in this gloomy place. But still, I've endured it all this whole time because I can't leave you. I think I'm in love with you. Beavis, I... How about you going to the city with me so that we could stay together? Oh my, it turned out that we both have feelings for each other, but because of that, he had to suffer in silence. Such a sweet guy. 
And it's true, he wasn't built for this harsh climate. He didn't belong here. The next morning, I told Eldon and Ira that I wanted to hang out in Miami for some days. Rana, I don't think it's a good idea. That pansy boy must have coaxed you to do this. Don't buy those sweet words. I tried my best to explain how nice and polite Beavis was, but they wouldn't listen. Girl, he got you all blinded. You've only known him for a few days, not enough to tell what kind of person he is. Can't believe you're just one of those shallow girls. Who are you calling shallow? Yeah, right. I was blinded. Blinded by his kindness. Then I stormed off, leaving Eldon and Ira behind. I just worry about you. Yeah, right. Worry? Or are you just jealous of me? I came home to a shivering Beavis. He couldn't stand this freezing weather anymore, and I couldn't bear seeing him like this either. So I told Beavis that I would go with him. Look how happy Beavis was, and I too was excited to visit his hometown. It's gonna be fun. It took only less than two days for us to arrange things out, buy the tickets, ask Ira to look after Bam and Holly, and we're good to go. After a long flight, we're finally here. It looks like a completely different world in front of my eyes. Crowds of people rushing left and right. Suddenly, I spotted something. Oh, that looks just like my Holly. What a spoiled husky. At that age, my two buddies were already the best sled dogs in the area. Oopsie. City folks don't seem too friendly, do they? Huh? What else? Why is it moving so fast and nonstop? While I hesitated to take a step, Beavis suddenly carried me up in the air. Don't worry, I got you. Oh boy, he's so sweet. Beavis then got me transformed into a city girl. He took me shopping, then got my hair dyed. I really like my silky black hair, but Beavis said this looked better on me. This too, baby girl. This is a tattoo parlor, isn't it? Seeing my confusion, Beavis explained that couples here usually get tattooed on important occasions, and today marks the first day that you walk into my world, so I want it imprinted in my heart. So Beavis and I got matching tattoos that he chose, a weird-looking red shape behind the ears. It might not look pretty, but was definitely unique enough to be special for just us two. Once we were done shopping, we went to a luxurious villa. Oh my, is he taking me to his parents? I'm so nervous, not sure how I should behave when Beavis comforted me. They were nice, don't worry, just do as they tell you to. Just then, the main door opened. Everyone turned to look at us full of excitement. This must be the first time Beavis took his girlfriend home then. Uh, Hello, hello everyone. I... Suddenly a man walked straight over and lifted my chin. Very similar, but... But this, but that. Just look at her birthmark. It's Demi. Thank Thank goodness. goodness. Our Our beloved beloved daughter daughter has has returned. returned. I was still processing everything when everyone rushed to hug me and bombarded me with questions. I turned to Beavis for help, but where is he? What's going on? I tried to explain that I was Brenna, born in the snowy Arctic. Both my parents had passed away and this was my first time leaving my hometown, but to no avail. My precious daughter, Beavis told us everything. You fell in the woods and had a concussion, so you're having a temporary memory loss. Just get rested for now, okay? Oh, where is Beavis then? I gotta ask him something. Don't worry, your savior will be well rewarded. You'll see him tomorrow. (sighs) Everything happens so fast, I'm totally lost. But the most I could do now is to wait until tomorrow. I'm sure Beavis will clear things up. Upon catching sight of Beavis, I immediately unloaded it all onto him. Shush, just listen to me first. Turned out, Beavis worked here for the Atchley's family. He escorted their daughter, Demi, on a trip to the mountains, but she ran away. Mrs. Atchley was utterly furious about this and used his ill mother to blackmail him into finding Demi. That's why he risked going out into the snowstorm where we met. But why me? I have nothing to do with Demi. You and Demi look just like twins. (gasps) When I saw you, I couldn't believe my eyes either. I did what I did because I was worried for my mom. I hope you can forgive me and help us, please. I'll soon find Demi. So, you were only using me. No, I'm truly in love with you, Brenna. I didn't want to be away from you, and you deserve a much better life here, with me. But... Just wait until I find Demi, then we will run away and live happily together. Poor Beavis. He seriously had the worst luck. If I were him, I guess I would do the same. So I reluctantly lived as Demi. Luckily, her parents thought I lost my memory, which made it not too hard to be her. One day, I received a text from Eldon. I suddenly remembered that I'd been away from home for almost a month. I wonder if Bam and Holly miss me. To say I was not one bit homesick would be a lie. But there's no way I'd speak to Eldon. So I called Ira to catch up on things and asked for her help in the search for Demi. It had been a few days already, but neither Ira nor Beavis had heard anything about Demi. Feeling too restless, I went for a walk in the garden. Wait, what's that noise? Eldon? See what you got yourself into, idiot. 
Told ya, I saw right through him. Why are you here? And what are you talking about? Era already told me. Beavis obviously only sees you as someone else's replacement. He doesn't love you. Let's go home. No, let me go. Stop bothering my girl. Leave me alone, please. You're only making things worse. This place has everything and is much better than a hellhole in the middle of nowhere. Live there all you want. Don't drag me down with you. Eldon immediately let my hand go. He didn't say another word, but gave me a disappointed look. Was that too much? Well, he's the one who kept sticking his nose in others' business. Who is he to control me? After that day, I still saw him lurking around the mansion sometimes. So annoying. Who in their right mind would be out in this scorching heat? Today, Mom, I mean Mrs. Ashley, suddenly took me shopping. I guess having a family like this isn't too bad, huh? She said tonight I was attending an important dinner party, so I had to put on this tight dress along with a pair of killer heels. They looked pretty good, but I really couldn't breathe. Jeez, how can anyone do this? It's literally harder than walking on thin ice. Ah! Phew, that was close. Thank you, sir. I- Careful, I can't be around to protect you all the time. Alden, why is he still so kind to me? I wanted to say something to him, but Mom already signaled for me to hurry up from afar. I rushed to the car, leaving him there. Thanks to Mom's preparation, the guys there were staring at me without blinking, especially the special guest. Mom told me that I was supposed to be smiley and friendly to Otis, but how was I supposed to do that when he kept rambling all these boring stories? My eyes wandered around, searching for Beavis and an excuse to leave. What are you looking for, sweetie? The most important person is already right in front of you. Ugh! I pushed him away, then ran off. Ah, uh, there are Beavis is. We should get out of this boring place. Oh, Mrs. Ashley's here too? What? That's it? I risk being in danger just to find her and bring her back to you. Don't take me for a fool. I'm only her stepmother, but I can tell that girl isn't Demi. I just let you off since she resembled her quite a bit. You're in no position to demand. But didn't you get Otis all smitten also? Isn't that all you care about anyway? So give me my money. I had to rack my brain to sweet talk that girl into coming here. That means your sickly mother doesn't exist either, does she? Oh, sweet, you've heard it all. So what if that's true? You won't get a dime. I'll expose your scheme. Where are you going, sweetheart? It's bedtime. So my phone was confiscated and I'd been locked in this room for three days straight. They wanted me to give in and date Otis, but no way. I tried every possible way to escape, but always ended up getting caught. One morning, I was woken up by dogs barking. Annoyed, I went to the balcony to check and saw Elden and Bam. Elden signaled for me to stay calm and flew a paper plane to me, then swiftly left. Let's see. <gasps> Fine then, if that's what he wants. Let's end things here once and for all. I agreed to date Otis like the Ashleys demanded. I even enthusiastically chose my own outfit, did my makeup with a cute hairstyle. Mr. and Mrs. Ashley were very pleased with that. They couldn't hide their excitement and even stood at the gate to welcome Otis when he came to pick me up. As his supercar arrived, Otis the preppy guy had just stepped out when Eldon signaled Bam to charge at him and scared him away. Meanwhile, the Ashleys were screaming for security. I was gonna leave in the midst of the chaos, but... Don't you dare run away! Ugh! Holly jumped out of nowhere and made Beavis fall to his knees. Holly then bit on his pants and dragged him around. Good job, baby! Right then, a car stopped in front of us and a girl stepped out who looked just like me. <gasps> this must be Demi! Who are you? Why do you look exactly like my daughter? What kind of father are you to not recognize your own child? This is precisely why I ran away from home. After that, Demi exposed her stepmother and Beavis's evil plan in my stead. Demi's dad frantically apologized to his daughter and admitted that he'd always been so caught up with work that he overlooked family and his wife's scheme. Get out of my sight at once, and don't even think about bringing a dime with you. Then Eldon dragged me into the car, and in the driver's seat was... Era! Thank you, Era. Just me? Eldon did most of it. I shyly looked over at Eldon. Thank you, and... I'm sorry. It's okay. We're friends after all. I'll take care of you at all costs. Um, uh, anyway, just hope that you've learned your lesson now, Brunna. Not all that glitters is gold. Eldon's right. This beautiful city is glamorous, but I don't belong here. I belong to the wind and snow, to the winterland I call home. Time to go back. The trip to the city was like a fever dream, but let's leave it all behind, cause I'm busy racing with Eldon. As expected, he's always as slow as a turtle. Hi, this is for you. For me? What's the occasion? The day we stop being friends. Brenna, what do you say if we become more than friends?